the third paper is on from Singapore. Utility, utility of PSMA PET CT for staging of primary prostate carcinoma from Singapore. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Charles, and today I'm here to talk to you about the util utility of a PSMA PET CT in the staging of primary prostate carcinoma. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my other co investigators from my department, uh, the Department of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging in the Singapore General Hospital, as well as from the Division of Radiation Oncology uh, in the National Cancer Center, Singapore. So, um, prostate cancer is actually a very significant problem worldwide. It is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in males worldwide, and in our country, it's the third most common cancer diagnosed uh, among Singaporean males. Um, it is the sixth most common cause of cancer death in our country, uh, and this discrepancy between the frequency and the mortality is attributable to the indolent nature of the disease in a lot of patients, as well as the advances that have been made in terms of therapy for this disease. So this is a bit of a busy slide, uh, but it's the staging recommendations by the NCCN guidelines. And I would like to uh, draw your attention to this particular section of it, where it says that the patients who have prostate cancer, um, they should under undergo either bone scan or pelvic CT or MRI, uh, depending on the risk factors as well as the symptoms for the patient. So as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the conventional imaging modalities for staging include MRI and CT. Uh, these are mostly used to stage the prostate cancer, local staging of the prostate cancer, as well as the nodal staging of prostate cancer. And bone scan is used to determine the presence of bony metastatic disease. Uh, Transrectal ultrasound is also used to localize the primary prostate cancer, as well as to obtain tissue uh, for histology. In terms of newer imaging techniques, such as uh, fluorocholine PET that has been used previously for uh, prostate cancer, still in use in many centers worldwide, but I think most people would be aware that uh, in recent years, prostate-specific membrane antigen has come to the forefront of imaging for prostate cancer. So a brief statement, what is prostate-specific membrane antigen? It is a type 2 cell surface, a membrane glycoprotein that is overexpressed by up to 1,000 times in almost all prostate cancer cells. Uh, it's not entirely specific, despite the name, for prostate uh, cancer. Because in other tumors, um, there can also be increased PSMA expression in the stroma of the tumor neovasculature. So it's been reported as being positive in other kinds of cancers, like lung or other kinds of cancers as well. And how do we make use of this antigen? We actually uh, use a ligand that binds to the PSMA and is internalized into the cells and can then be imaged. So why are we so interested in staging of prostate cancer? Uh, I already mentioned it's a very common disease. The disease burden is quite large. but What's uh, more important is that if you accurately stage it, uh, this has actually very important uh, implications on the treatment as well as prognosis for the patients. Uh, patients who have localized disease only can often have curative treatment using either surgery or radiotherapy, uh, whereas patients who have metastatic disease, uh, they may be relegated to hormonal therapy, or in some cases uh, for oligometastatic disease, there's been some interest in doing localized therapies for um, the oligometastatic disease. And also, like I mentioned, the disease in most patients has a very indolent course. But there are some patients who have extensive uh, metastatic disease who can, in which this disease can be very rapidly fatal. So it's quite important to be able to differentiate these groups. And what's the problem with our current uh, staging modalities? So we have shown you what uh, some of the staging modalities are. And in particular for nodal staging, CT and MRI have been shown to have very poor uh, sensitivity with uh, Previous meta-analysis showing it at only about 40% uh, sensitivity for nodal disease. So how can we improve on this? Uh, PSMA PET uh, has been reported to have a very high sensitivity and specificity. In a fairly recent meta-analysis by Pereira et al., sensitivity and specificity were both reported at 86% for patients who have histopathology correlation. Uh, unfortunately, in this uh, meta-analysis, and actually in a lot of the literature, most of the data is in the context of biochemical recurrence. And uh, there is a lot of emerging data, but there is relatively less data in terms of primary staging. Uh, there have been reports suggesting the value of PSMA PET for intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer staging. 
So this is actually um, a slide showing um, the rate of PSMA PET CTs that we have been <coughs> performing in our center since its introduction in 2015. So the third quarter of 2015, we started doing the scans and we introduced it for uh, biochemical recurrence. And as you can see, um, in the time since then, we have had a very rapid increase in terms of demand from urologists and oncologists for this scan because of, based mainly on the, the weight of the very good performance, uh, especially in biochemical recurrence. But what's interesting for us is that even though we told them it was for biochemical recurrence at first, now we are finding that 42% of the scans that we are actually doing in our department are for staging. So we were quite interested to see what is the performance in this cohort of patients in our population. So we wanted to see how much value we are bringing to the oncologists and the urologists. And in particular, we wanted to find out what patients are more likely to have a positive scan so we can advise them on who to send for PSMA PET. It's not a cheap study. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's being used well. Um, our study was a retrospective study that was approved by our institution review board. And we uh, were actually using uh, 68, uh, gallium 68 PSMA 11. There are various ligands, but this is probably the most commonly used ligand right now worldwide. Uh, and we looked at the scans of 63 consecutive patients referred for staging of prostate cancer between August 2015 to June of 2017. So how do we uh, go about looking at the scans? We evaluated the scans for the presence of tracer avid nodal as well as distant metastasis. And we defined uh, tracer avid metastasis as one with focal tracer uptake above surrounding background, which was not because of any physiological tracer uptake. Uh, we looked at the CT component of our PET-CT scans to look for enlarged nodes, which is defined as more than one centimeter if they were oval or blanc shape, or more than eight millimeters if they were round. And we correlated these results with the patient's uh, PSA levels, the prostate-specific antigen levels, and VEASAN scores. Um, and this is a slide showing the biodata from our population of patients. As can be expected, almost all the patients were elderly males with a median age of 69 in the range of 49 to 85. Most of our patients had Gleason scores between 7 to 9, uh, with two patients at a Gleason score of 6 and one with a Gleason score of 10. The PSA values for our patients were on the high end, with a median value of 25, a range of as low as 2.8 and as high as 287. Um, as can be expected from the Gleason scores as well as PSA scores, uh, most of our patients were intermediate to high risk. In fact, more than half of them were high risk patients based on d classification. Uh, and what did we find? We found that in these patients, 38% or almost 40% had tracer avid metastatic disease. Uh, that's 24 patients out in this entire group. And looking at the patients who had metastatic disease, we found that 20 of them, or 32%, had nodal metastases, 10 of them, or 16%, had bony metastases, and six of them had both nodal and bony metastases. So as can be seen, more of the patients that had positive scans findings outside the prostate actually had nodal disease. Um, this is quite important because uh, even though we didn't have bone scan for all these patients, um, a lot of these, the bone scan won't pick up the nodal disease. And in fact, uh, the CT scan may sometimes miss this nodal disease because the nodes are actually quite small. A lot of times, uh, the metastatic nodes may not be identified based on size criteria. And so how do we know this? Looking at the nodal metastases, so the 20 patients with nodal metastases, six of them were actually outside of the pelvis. Um, and if you look at the top right hand, we have one, one patient who had an unexpected nodal met on uh, the left supraclavicular region, so it wouldn't have been picked up with a pelvic CT or an MRI. And uh, there are other examples that I'm not showing here. Uh, and actually out of those, even those with regional nodes, uh, a number of them have very small nodes, like you can see on the bottom right. It's a tiny node there. Nobody would call it as positive on CT or MRI. However, it's extremely avid on uh, PSMA. So uh, it's quite an easy call for us as uh, nuclear medicine physicians. So looking at this 20 uh, patients who had nodal metastases, we found that 14 of them, or 70%, actually would have been missed using routine staging, either because they were not within the uh, field of view of a routine staging CT or MR, or uh, had nodes that were smaller than would be called positive on uh, CT or MR. And what was our overall detection rate based on the PSA, uh, segregated by PSA and uh, recent scores? We found that more than uh, double the, the, the rate of pickup of metastasis in patients with PSA of more than 10, so 40% versus 15% at PSA of less than 10. Uh, and 
a slightly increased uh, pickup rate for metastases in Gleason score of more than seven versus uh, less than seven, with a 43% versus 29%. So overall, we picked up more metastatic disease, as can be expected, at higher PSA values and Gleason scores. Uh, unfortunately, because of our small study cohort, we actually these results tended to but didn't reach a significance. It's uh, also a retrospective study design, and we didn't have histopathology correlation for a lot of these patients. So these are some limitations that we faced with our study. Actually, so in conclusion, uh, we found that in our study cohort, uh, PSMA PET CT uh, identified a significant number of lymph node and bony metastases, especially in patients with higher PSA scores of more than 10 or Gleason score of more than seven. And um, one important point that I think uh, our colleagues in urology and oncology also appreciate is that 70% of these metastatic nodes that we picked up on PSMA PET CT would not have been detected on routine staging with CT or MRI, which highlights the value of PSMA PET CT in these patients uh, who either may need a more extended uh, pelvic nodal dissection, um, extended video therapy fields, or may even not be suitable for um, initial treatment with a curative surgery or radiotherapy. And so in particular, for patients with intermediate to high risk primary prostate cancer, we found that PSMB scan is of a lot of value, and we actually expect to see a continued increase in the number of referrals that we're seeing from this wonderful scan that we can do for the patients. So uh, thank you um, for your time. <laughs> and we'd like to welcome you to come to Singapore next year for a nuclear medicine update if you have the time. Thank no. you so much. <laughs> Is there any question? For... Is there any question for him? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please to come here. The next presentation is uh, uh, from Bangladesh. Aspect myocardial perfusion imaging in patients with history of thrombolysis after myocardial infarction. Dr. Azmail Kabir Saruka, please. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, present uh, our work in front of this audience. Uh, Uh, so the title of my presentation is SPECT Myocardial Perfusion Imaging in Patients with History of Thrombolysis After Myocardial Infarction. Uh, I want to thank Society of Nuclear Medicine Bangladesh for nominating me here and Asian School of Nuclear Medicine for supporting and to my colleagues, professors and technologists. As you all know, thrombolytic therapy is indicated in patients with SC segment elevation myocardial infarction within 12 hours of onset of symptoms, uh, and which is commonly associated with complete occlusion of a coronary artery by an acute thrombotic obstruction. And what STK does here, it's a non-fibrin-specific lytic, which is capable of lysing circulating and clot-bound plasminogen to plasmin, resulting in systemic fibrinogen lysis. And also it does fibrinolysis to bound clots. It was introduced in 1933 and then used in acute MI in 1958 and uh, then approved in 1986. And what it does, it uh, STK after an acute myocardial infarction uh, reduces the infarct size and improves left ventricular ejection fraction. The cardiac emergency departments of major government facilities in Bangladesh have been using streptokinase since early 90s and still we are using this. Uh, in contrast to number of patients undergoing thrombolysis, the number of patients referred for post-thrombolysis assessment of myocardial perfusion or viability by SPECT myocardial perfusion imaging is lower because SPECT myocardial perfusion imaging is limitedly available in our, in our country and we had no data of our own population regarding post-thrombolysis myocardial perfusion status. So objective of this small stu uh, study was to describe the features of patients who received streptokinase with diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction and then underwent 
SPECT marker alpha fusion imaging. So what happened to these patients? They had an acute MI and then they underwent CAG and right after that they underwent SPECT marker alpha fusion imaging. So this was essentially a retrospective cross-sectional study. It was conducted in 2007. In those patients who were referred to our center for this imaging since February 2005 to October 2016. And our institution is called Nuclear, uh, National Institute of Nuclear Medicine and Allied Sciences, which is in Dhaka, capital of Bangladesh. So all patients who received streptokinase with diagnosis of an acute MI were selected. And the data was analysis. Data analysis was done using SPSS. All these patients underwent spec marker repulsion imaging with MIBI, Technetium 99M leveled MIBI, and we used a dual head gamma camera. So this is a representative image of a normal perfusion scan in a 67 years old male. Uh, we are using 4DM spec for analysis. And this patient had a large infarct in a 50 years old male, and this patient had a very small infarction with a surrounding area of ischemia. So during uh, this uh, time period from 2005 to 2016, uh, 1,347 patients underwent SPECT MPI and 59 had received streptokinase after acute MI. 56 patients were male and the mean age was 51 years. Uh, so these patients, uh, 36 patients underwent pharmacological stress and others underwent treadmill exercise and eight patients underwent rest imaging only. And to give a more uh, detail, uh, eight patients underwent adenosine and 28 dobutamine stress. And here is an outline of the time interval among the incidences. Uh, the mean time interval from acute MI to coronary angiogram was 12 weeks. Uh, from coronary angiogram to SPECT MPI was 10 weeks, and from acute MI to SPECT MPI was about 21 weeks. So when we looked uh, at, at the coronary angiography results, uh, 11 patients had normal coronary angiogram, 20 had single vessel disease, 12 had double vessel disease, and 16 had triple vessel disease. Uh, but actually, among these 11 patients, a few patients had a non-critical coronary stenosis. That, that's why they were reported as normal. So six patients had non-critical coronary stenosis involving single vessel or, others, or multiple vessels. So finally, for this analysis, we uh, got five patients having normal coronary angiogram and 54 patients having uh, abnormal coronary angiogram, while the SPECT MPI result was abnormal in 43 and 60 patients had normal SPECT MPI results. So uh, we put, it, put this data in a two by two table and we can see hmm, uh, 16 patients who had a normal perfusion later, 12 had an abnormal coronary angiography earlier, and among 43 patients who had an abnormal perfusion later, 42 had an abnormal coronary angiogram earlier. So 43 patients had abnormal spec perfusion. So the mean rest left ventricular ejection fraction in them was 40%, with a mean total left ventricular infarct size of 48%. Previous coronary revascularization was done in 17 patients. Six patients among 12 who had normal perfusion had previous coronary revascularization. And among these 17 patients, few had uh, coronary revascularization earlier than the attack, and some had coronary revascularization after the attack. So in conclusion, in this study group, 16 of 59 patients, which was 27%, who had received streptokinase had normal perfusion. 75% of patients, uh, that is 12 of 16, who had normal perfusion had a previous abnormal coronary angiogram. And six patients out of 12 patients who had normal perfusion 
had an abnormal coronary angiography, actually had undergone coronary vascularization. So post-thrombolytic SPECT MPI revealed normal perfusion despite of having an abnormal coronary angiogram and without any coronary vascularization in six patients. So that was all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now this paper is open for discussion. Is there any comment or question? Okay, thank you. Next paper is from Philippines. This prognostic value of left ventricular eccentricity, eccentricity index, index measured with gated myocardial perfusion single photon emission tomography, computer tomography. Um, good afternoon. I'm Danison Lampano uh, from the Philippine Heart Center, and I'll be presenting my research paper entitled Prognostic Value of Left Ventricular Eccentricity Index Measured with Gated Myocardial Perfusion Spec. So just a brief background, the left ventricle is normally elliptical in shape. Owing to the heart's property of being a remarkably plastic organ, it is capable to change substantially in the various measures of its architecture as a response to myocardial injury or chronic loading. This process is known as remodeling. It involves changes in the LV volume, shape, and ultimately its function. So these are just measures of LV remodeling that can be determined using different um, imaging modalities, and indices from these measures can be um, derived. These are the diagnostic procedures commonly used that allow us to evaluate the left ventricle. For the purposes of my presentation, um, I will be uh, focusing on MPS, although not primarily used to evaluate remodeling. So we all know that MPS is um, an invaluable tool in the evaluation mainly of CAD. So its indications are summarized as below. So aside from determining the extent, severity, and location of perfusion abnormalities, additional parameters that provide prognostic information are also available as follows. So some of which, uh, sorry, some of which can be uh, quantitated with the development of ECG gating. So another measure generated by commonly available softwares for cardiac spect is the left ventricular eccentricity. It is a measure of the elongation of the left ventricle and is calculated using the short <coughs> and long axis dimensions with the formula below. Uh, this is also used to compute for the eccentricity of conic sections or measuring how much it deviates from being circular. A value of zero or close to zero means that the section is a sphere and a value of one or close to one means that the shape is uh, linear or more elliptical in shape. Uh, there are many available literatures on LV remodeling, mostly exploring on the LV dimensions and functions. Fewer studies on LV shape have been uh, made and with contrasting results as to whether there is an association between the LV shape and the patient's clinical outcome. Most of these studies also used uh, echocardiograms. There are limited literatures on LV shape that utilized MPS, two of which uh, used eccentricity and in index as a measure of LV shape, hence this study was done. So the objectives of my study are to determine the uh, correlation between LVEI and other MPS parameters, such as SSS, TID, LV volumes, and LVEF, and to determine the predictive value and diagnostic accuracy of LVEI in predicting future cardiac events. So this is a cross-sectional study done at the Philippine Heart Center. The minimum required uh, number of patients is 114, but I was able to include 353 patients. <clears throat> so we included all adult patients who underwent stress uh, system EB MPS from 2013 to 2015, and those with sub, uh, technically suboptimal scans, uh, inadequate exercise, and significant arrhythmia were excluded. So these are 
sorry. So uh, these are the patient characteristics. So my study variables include uh, uh, those parameters that are routinely quantitated using uh, 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 commonly available cardiac softwares for spec. And the de dependent variables include major adverse cardiac events defined as cardiac death due to MI or other um, cardiac uh, reasons, non-fatal myocardial infarctions, acute coronary syndromes, acute heart failure. So Spearman's raw was used to determine the correlation between the variables. Um, so those written in red means that uh, there is significant correlation between EI and these parameters. So therefore, um, all of the uh, MPS parameters are correlated with EI. So uh, these are just uh, the scatter plots. For REST EI, uh, we further uh, did um, subgroup analysis. So we divided the group into males and females. Surprisingly, um, the correlation was only significant among males. Um, and this may be explained by findings in the study of um, Dr. Ambali Vekantash et al that females tend to have more spherical um, left ventricles as compared to males. So these are just the scatter plots. So again, uh, we tried comparing the correlation of EI with other MPS parameters among patients who underwent exercise and those who underwent diprydamol stress test. So basically most of the MPS parameters have um, or are significantly correlated with EI. So we tried to follow up uh, these patients, and uh, there were 141 patients who we were able to contact and agreed to uh, be interviewed. Uh, among them, 104 were event-free, and 37 had a major cardiac events. So the patient characteristics were significant; uh, were not significantly uh, different between the two groups. Um, logistic regression was used to determine the predictive value of the MPS parameters. And among the MPS parameters, only, the, uh, on, only transient ischemic dilatation and post-stress EI were, uh, were found to be uh, independent predictors of uh, MACE. So um, sensitivity and specificity were calculated for each cut of points, and ROC curves were um, created. And as you can see, um, the area under the curve was not that high, just 0 0.57 and 0 0.59 for rest and stress, respectively. So the cut point was determined or was set at 0 0.8 for both rest and post-stress EI. And we tried to check uh, if they have incremental prognostic value among the subgroups. So we divided the patients, or we uh, did a subgroup analysis uh, using the following subgroups. So patients with abnormal myocardial perfusion, patients with dilated LV cavity, and those with um, LV dysfunction, as um, defined below. So among patients who have um, abnormal myocardial perfusion and those with LV dysfunction, there was modest in improvement in the area under the curve. However, among patients with dilated LV cavity, there was a remarkable uh, improvement in the AUC. So we also tried to check if there is an improvement in the sensitivity if we include um, eccentricity index on top of the different parameters. So among patients with abnormal myocardial perfusion, uh, you can see that um, although not that significant, there was uh, an increase in the detection of MACE among patients with myocardial uh, perfusion when um, EI was added, but of course not without a uh, consequent decrease in the specificity. So among patients with uh, LV dysfunction and those with um, dilated LV cavity. So in conclusion, left ventricular eccentricity index is positively correlated with LVEF, negatively correlated with SSSTID and LV volumes. Lower LVEI may be suggestive of a poor clinical outcome, especially among patients with dilated left uh, ventricles and uh, left ventricular eccentricity index increases the prognostic value of SSS, LV volumes, and LVEF. Thank you. Is there any question? Do you have any question?
No, thank you very much. Next is uh, uh, from Japan, uh, Dr. Takashi Norikane. The presentation title is a Comparison Between SUV and Retention Index Images Using Carbon 11 PIB PET for Assessment of Cardiac Amyloidosis. So please. Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, everyone. My presentation is Comparison Between SUV and uh, Retention Index Images Acquired Using Carbon 11 PIB for assessment of cardiac amyloidosis. Sorry. The pet tracer uh, carbon 11 Pittsburgh compound B PIB has been used with very good results for imaging beta amyloid in the evaluation of brain amyloidosis, and it's believed to bind to myocardial amyloid. Anthony first reported PIB PET in imaging cardiac amyloidosis in 2011 using retention index images. The purpose of this study was to investigate the feasibility of PIB PET for the detection of cardiac amyloidosis and to investigate PIB accumulation by comparison of RI images and standardized uptake value SUV images. Six patients with cardiac amyloidosis and two healthy volunteers were examined with PIB PET CT. The characteristics of cardiac amyloidosis patients were shown in the slide. Air type in three, ATTR type in two, and A type in one. All acquisitions were performed using a biograph NCT PET CT scanner. PET emission scanning of the heart region with 60 minutes dynamic scan starting simultaneously with intravenous in dorous injection of PIB. CT data for attenuation correction was obtained. The RI images were calculated as the mean PIB radioactivity concentration between 15 and 25 minutes after injection divided by the integral of the arterial time activity curve between 0 and 20 minutes after injection, according to the previous report by Anthony. The SUV images were reconstructed by summing all images from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and 50 to 60 minutes of the dynamic PIB PET scan. For visual analysis, the RI images were visually compared with SUV images. For same quantitative analysis from RI images and SUV images, the myocardium to blood pool ratio MBR of region was calculated by region of interest analysis. This slide shows the results of visual analysis. Myocardial PIB uptake was visually evident in all six patients on RI image and 10 to 20 minutes SUV image. Myocardial PIB uptake was not seen in two healthy volunteers on both RI and SUV images. The uptake on 0 to 10 minutes SUV image may reflect the myocardial perfusion. This slide shows the results of semi-quantitative analysis. The mean values of MBR using RI image, 10 to 20 minutes 
SUV image and 20 to 30 minute SUV image in cardiac amyloidosis patients were significantly higher than those in healthy volunteers. Especially on 10 to 20 minute SUV image, it showed the highest difference between cardiac amyloidosis patients and healthy volunteers. This is the case of healthy volunteer. Myocardial PIB uptake are not seen on RI image and SUV images, except 0 to 10 SUV image. This is a case of cardiac amyloidosis with ATTR. RI image and 0 to 10 and 10 to 20 SUV images showed avid uptake in myocardium. And 20 to 30 minute SUV image also showed faint uptake in myocardium. PIB PET imaging uh, may reflect directly amyloid deposit. In the first study of 10 patients with cardiac amyloidosis, PIB uptake of RI image was seen in all patients compared to absent uptake in controls. Recent studies revealed the usefulness of PIB PET for diagnosing and identifying cardiac amyloidosis. However, imaging methods including RI image and SUV image varied on individual researchers. The appropriate reconstruction was equivocal yet. In the present study, the diagnostic performance on 10 to 20 SUV image was the same as that on RI image. In conclusion, these preliminary results indicate that PIB PET seems to be a useful imaging modality for cardiac amyloidosis. In addition, the SUV image at 10 to 20 minutes might be useful for assessment of cardiac amyloidosis as well as RI image. Thank you. Is there any comment or question from the audience? 